Hey, what's up everybody? Welcome to My Pixel. It's awesome to have you here today. Today we're starting a pixel art power tool series which is dedicated to introducing you to some of the many tools used when making pixel art. For our first episode, we'll take a look at a program called Paint.net. Paint.net is a free painting slash image editing software that is available on Windows platforms. You can visit their website for more details and also to download the software. The software is easy to use and has more than enough functionality for pixel art purposes. Personally, I've been using Paint.net for many years and even though other applications may offer more advanced features, I find that Paint.net's minimalistic approach always keeps me coming back to it. This is especially the case when I'm prototyping and doing experimental designs and other things where I'm just looking to quickly bang out some pixel art. In these cases, I'm not working on a project that has a whole bunch of animations or that involves a lot of heavy image manipulation. Instead, I'm just looking to pixel out an idea that I have and try to get a feel for if this is an idea that I want to continue to develop. Paint.net is great for situations just like this. So to start, we'll look at some basic setup I do when using this program for pixel art purposes. Paint.net is actually made to do a whole lot more than just pixel art, so the default settings are not quite the best fit for what we're doing here today. Alright, first let's look at some initial setup. So for that, we'll open up a new canvas here. For that, we'll just uh, start with 128 by 128 pixels. That's what I like to start with. Uh, if it's a little bit small, don't worry, you can always expand the canvas later. Okay, so here we have our canvas. Okay, and the first thing you want to do in your setup is you want to make sure that you can see these rulers, right, on the top and on the side. Right? If you can't see the rulers, like so, then you just need to click this button to show the rulers. Okay, the next thing you want to do is make sure that your rulers are set up to show you increments of pixels. I believe the default is inches when you first install the software. Right? If you have inches or centimeters, that's really not going to do us much good when we're drawing some pixel art, right? So just make sure you have that set to pixels. If you like, you can also set that same setting down here. You have pixels, inches, centimeters. So we'll leave it at pixels. One more thing that I'd like to show you as part of this view is the pixel grid. So for that, I'll bring up an image that I had created earlier. Here, here we go. So let's say you're kind of zoomed in over here and you know you want to see how many pixels wide this is, right? You could count it or you could look up here on the ruler. It's a little bit hard, especially when you have this solid color here, right? You, it's hard to count the squares. So in that case, you might want to enable the pixel grid, which is right up here. Right, so you see the grid comes up and it's much easier to work with, right? If you're trying to space things by four pixels each, you can easily count four pixels in a place with a solid color that is really hard to count pixels in. Now the only time, or well, when zoomed in, I think that works really well. When zoomed out though, I don't think the grid is necessary or even it starts to become a hindrance because the grid lines start to take up more of your image, right? Um, if you're like me, you're looking at this and you start to think that the lines get in the way of the image, it starts to make things blurry. If you're working with colors that are very close to each other, the colors get start to get muddled because of the gray lines and everything like that, right? As you can see, the further out we zoom, the more space the lines take up and it starts to look pretty ugly, right? In those instances, you just, uh, well, you simply just disable the pixel grid. So for me personally, when I'm zoomed out, I have the pixel grid disabled. And when I'm zoomed in, uh, about half the time, pretty often, I have the pixel grid enabled because it really helps me to get a better feel for where I am. All right, next up, let's take a look at some of the default settings that the program uses. So let's just disable this pixel grid. Okay, and we'll go into the settings right here. Okay, now I already have this set up with uh, how I like it. So I'm going to go ahead and reset it to the program defaults. Okay, here we go. Now most times you're probably going to want to be working with a pencil. So the first thing I do is I set my default tool to the pencil. The pencil is a one pixel wide, just 
completely solid um, dots, right? Or lines or what have you. So I set it to the pencil. Next up for the shape, brush, and fill, right? This um, these work for a lot of things like drawing rectangles or drawing lines, things of that sort. So by default, I would say you want your brush width to be one, right? Most often when I'm drawing lines, I just want a single pixel solid line, right? If you want to change this later on, you can, you know, feel free to do that in the settings, right? If you need a two pixel width line, then that's fine. But I think by default, you probably will want a one pixel most of the time. So that's what we set it at, or that's what I set it at here. As far as hardness, right? You want that set to a hundred, right? We're drawing pixels. We either want the pixel there or we don't want it there, right? We don't want any blurriness or anything like that. So 100 is good. For the selection tools, we don't need to touch anything here. Those defaults work fine. For text, same thing, works fine. Gradients, we're not touching that. Now we come down to the magic wand, paint bucket, and recolor, right? These all work off this tolerance value here. I, I would recommend that you set the tolerance to zero, and I'm gonna show you why. So let's close out of this, and let's grab our magic wand. Right. Let's say I want to select this orange color on his hat. So I click. Excuse me. Let's try that again. Let's make sure I'm on the right layer. Okay, there we go. Now I selected the orange exactly how you would imagine it to, right? If I want this red, I can select the red. If you begin to increase this tolerance, what the program will do is it'll begin to try and select areas that are within a certain percentage of that color, right? So it's going to look for similar colors. So you'll see as I increase this tolerance, it starts to select more area and more area, right? The problem with this is when you click, you don't know exactly what you're going to get. It depends on which color you click first, right? So I'm thinking most often pixel art, when you click, that's the color you want, right? So that's why we want our default set to zero as far as tolerance goes, all right? So let's jump back into the settings. Okay, go down here. Okay, zero. Okay, and it's for sampling, you see layer and single pixel. This works fine. Layer just means uh, when you take the sample or whatever you click on, it's going to use your current layer to do its work. If not, you can set it to image, in, waste, in which case it's going to do any visible layer that it can find. So you can set it to layer if you need it to be image you can just set it later right there's nothing wrong with leaving a default like this and with the sampling single pixel works well right they have all these other options where you can sample a larger area like let's say with the eyedropper here right i want to sample this color actually let's make sure it's not selecting everything right i want to sample this color right i click one pixel that's exactly what i want if not, what might happen is, right, 3x3, three 5x5, three, five five, it's going to try and sample an average of an area, right? Pixel art, this is, I'm pretty sure this is not what you want, right? So we leave our set to single pixel by default. Okay. Next up, we have the color picker, or you might know it as the eyedropper in Photoshop or other programs. Now for default, it says do not switch tool. I like to set this to switch the previous tool and I'll show you why. So let's say you're working with a pencil and actually let's say do not switch tool again. You're working with a pencil. Okay, I'm drawing this, um, I don't know, some random color black. And now I want this orange color. For that, I can select my eyedropper, go here. Right? But I still have the eyedropper tool. I have to go back to my pencil and then start drawing again. Right. But if you select switch to previous tool, right? let's say you have the pencil. I'm drawing with my pencil. Okay, now I want this, um, this reddish color. I eyedrop it once. It immediately gives me my pencil tool back. And I can do that there. Right? If I have the paint bucket tool, and I have the paint bucket, I'm doing something. 
Okay, let's say I want this color. Immediately, it gives me back my paint bucket tool. And I can get work done a lot faster like that. So because of that, I like to have it by default set to switch to previous tool. Okay, last up in the settings, or almost last up, is move selected pixels, quality by linear. All right, so if you're using anything except what we want, right, we want nearest neighbor. If you're, you're using anything except nearest neighbor, uh, when you start to move and select, you're going to, well, there's a good chance you're going to get anti-aliasing, right? Anti-aliasing is those blurry edges, right? Those half, you know, transparent pixels and stuff like that that are really common in a normal image, like a JPEG image, right? Some huge image you take off your camera, but for pixel art, we want the nice solid colors and hard edges. So for that, we want nearest neighbor. Okay, and under rasterization here, we wanna make sure that anti-aliasing is disabled, right? This is kind of along the same lines, right? It has to do with anti-aliasing. Right, when you're drawing a curve or something like that in this picture, right? You don't want a smooth curve and you're going to get these blurry lines, right? You want this hard edge, blocky, blocky look. Over here, the blending mode normal is fine. And then for the selection quality, we want a pixelated selection quality, right? No anti-aliasing for us because, yeah, we're, we're doing pixel art. So there we go. All right. And that finishes up the initial default settings that we want to set up. Now let's take a look at how to resize our canvas. So let's say we have something here. Okay, and actually this, this canvas I have is 120 by 128. Let's say, you know, I want to put more characters on here. So I'm starting to outgrow this small little canvas. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go up here to image and canvas size. Now let's just say, for instance, I want to expand this to 256 by 256, right? That, that's fine. That's easy enough. Makes sense. But now you have this anchor point, right? It says middle. You can click all around. Another way you can think about this is, well, you take a look at the arrows and this says, which way is my canvas going to expand? So in this situation, if you're in the middle, the canvas is going to expand in each direction equally until it hits 256 by 256. So let's try that. Okay, and we can see it did just that. Okay. But maybe we wanted this whole block over here, right? Maybe we wanted this whole thing and we wanted this actually to be in the upper left hand corner, right? So that we could work out here. Right, it's kind of a pain to go in and have to grab things and resize them. So let's try that again. In that situation, we can just choose a different anchor point. So we'll go again to canvas size. Set 256, 256. And then let's set the anchor point this time to this top left. Now the canvas will expand out to the right and downward. Let's try it. All right, and there we go. Because I'm starting small and then I always outgrow my canvas, I'm constantly using this feature. So that's why I thought it might be useful for me to show it to you all. So hopefully you can find that useful. All right, and now let's take a look at the layers. So like you might expect, paint.net comes with a layering system, right? If you're not familiar with layers, then I'll just give you a quick description, right? So you have the layers on the bottom, and the layers above, the layers on the above or the layers above will draw everything on top of the layers that are on the bottom, right? So in this case, we have actually let's let's revert this a little bit, get something easier to work with. And right, we have a background color that's gray. That's the layer on the bottom. And then we have a layer on the top of that where we drew all of our characters. So what you can do, right, is you can draw on one layer and not worry about it having your changes or, you know, maybe you mess something up. It won't affect the layer on the bottom. Right. So that's basically how it works. Also, you have layer blending modes. Right. So if you double click this, right, or you can just select your layer and then click this button down here, properties. 
you have these layer blending modes, right? So again, if you're familiar with Photoshop or other programs, you might have seen some of these before. Multiply, color dodge, screen, things like that. So this affects how the colors look when you have um, one layer on top of the other. So if you want to use that, that's there for you to use. Um, I think for pixel artists, most of the time, you won't find yourself doing so much of that because for pixel art, you're quite often selecting very specific colors, maybe in a very specific color palette. And when you're using those uh, layer blending modes, you're letting the program decide what color it wants to use for you, right? So in any case, like I said, it's there for you to use, but I just don't find myself using it very often. Paint.net also comes with the ability to save and load your own palettes. So we'll expand this here. By default, this is the palette that they gave you. Ahead of time, I went ahead and created some other palettes. You'll see this DB60 and DB32. I didn't think of these colors myself. It's called DB60 and DB32 because uh, if you give it a quick Google search, you'll figure it out. But in the pixel art world, these are very well-known palettes created by Dawnbringer. He's got a 16 color palette. He's got a 32 color palette that he made. I think he's also got an eight. Um, I wouldn't dare use the eight just because I'm not good enough to, to get away with a palette of eight colors. But this 32 color palette is very nice. There's a, a whole bunch of people out there making very impressive pieces of pixel art just with these 32 colors. So if you don't think that 32 colors is enough, just go out there and uh, check online and see what you can possibly do. But in any case, you can create these palettes. You can save and load them. If you want to load your own colors in here, right? Let's just say you start with this. Okay, and then maybe I want this shade of red in my palette. So I just select the color I want, click the add button, and then click the place where I'd want to set that color to. Right? If you want, you can eye drop something from maybe some uh, sprites that you might be using for reference, right? Maybe I want this, this color right here. As long as I have the color selected. Oh, I was on the wrong layer. Let's try that again. As long as I have the color selected, then I just click add and then I can add that to my palette. If I want, I can then save that palette. Right, save current palette as. All right, I already created one called My Palette. Let's call this My Palette 2. Okay, save. All right, so if for some reason you hit some funny buttons or something like that, reset the default palette. Now you have that palette saved. So you can always revert back to it. And then you're ready to go. So that was a quick look into what Paint.net can do for you and your pixel art project. It's quick to set up, easy to use, and I think it can make a great addition to your tool set. So that's going to do it for today. I'd like to thank you all for watching and I hope this helped you out. If you liked today's video, please give it a like and hit that subscribe button. As always, you can let me know how you're doing right down there in the comments, right? Tell me how you're doing on your projects. Tell me if this worked out for you, this uh, little paint.net introduction here, or uh, just stop by and say hello. For those who are interested in the palettes that I mentioned, I'll have the paint.net palette files available for download on my Patreon page. So if you want to check that out, I'll leave the link in the description. And with that, we're good. So thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one real soon. Take it easy.